Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Prevention and Early Detection of Dementia, Building Your Cognitive Reserve. My name is Robert May, and I'm the Executive Director at the Kensington here in Redondo Beach, a Kensington Senior Living Community offering assisted living and two levels of memory care in Redondo Beach, California. Kensington Senior Living has seven unique communities, four located in Virginia, Maryland, and New York and three sister communities located, located in California, Kensington is truly privileged to support caregivers from coast to coast. Kensington focuses on relationship-based care, care built on the foundation of our promise to love and care for your family member as we do our own. That promise is what initially drew me to become part of the Kensington organization in 2019. After working in the aging industry for over decades, I also see how difficult caregiving can be for spouses and loved ones, especially in today's rapidly moving and stressful environment. It is programs such as the one you are attending now that are so important for those of us walking through our caregiving journey to hear from expert professionals on keeping us current with the latest advance in care and management and treatment of conditions that affect seniors and their families. We are really delighted that you're taking time to join us for this afternoon's presentation and hearing from Brooke Skinny and Sherry Snelling. Everyone that registered will be receiving a copy of today's webinar to share with friends and families with links to valuable resources for our presenters. During this webinar, you will hear from a longtime brain health advocate turned entrepreneur about the power of changing the conversation in Alzheimer's disease. You will also learn from a gerontologist about the steps you can take today to make your brain health better. And participants will gain an understanding of the current landscape around early detection and diagnosis. It's time to break through the stigma and start the conversation. If you're new to the Zoom platform, this presentation is in webinar format. This means your cameras and microphones will remain off and muted throughout the presentation. We will be answering questions that were previously submitted at the time of registration, but we'll also answer additional questions submitted in the Q&A if time permits. I would like now to proudly introduce our presenters, Brooks and Cherry, and please join us and share a few words about yourselves this afternoon. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Um, and thank you to uh, Kensington for having us. Um, I'm Brooks Kenny. And Sherry and I are joining you tonight, and we are longtime friends. So I just have to share that right up front. We've known each other for over 15 years. So um, we're going to treat this as a conversation among girlfriends, which is actually pretty uh, important when you think about how we need to normalize the conversation around our brains. Um, I also just wanted to share a fun fact. I live in a town called Kensington, and Kens one of the locations that Robert mentioned is uh, right around the corner from my house, um, and my family has volunteered there before, and um, it's just such a privilege and delight to be with all of you uh, this evening. Well, it's evening for me, but it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, hi, Sherry. How are you? Hi, Brooks. Good to be here. <laughs> Great to talk with you. Um, so why don't we both just introduce ourselves? I'm happy to, to st um, start and then kick it over to you. Um, as, as Robert said, um, I my background is in healthcare advocacy. I've been an advocate for primarily women's health and uh, Alzheimer's for most of my career. I have a master's in public health and have been a health educator um, and really have been focused in the last 10 years on um, Alzheimer's disease and trying to break the stigma, trying to figure out how we can start talking about our brains as vital organs. How can we empower ourselves and one another in order to move these conversations forward? You know, I often say, and Sherry's probably heard me say it too many times, you know, we're 20 years behind when it comes to Alzheimer's disease, 20 years behind cancer, which is something we were so free to talk about. And now being heart health this month, you know, people are wearing red. Well, we need to start talking about Alzheimer's in a new way so that we can get people the support they need. So I'm getting into my, I'm getting into our conversations, which I'll stop. But um, I most recently was um, uh, part of a nonprofit advocacy organization called Us Against Alzheimer's, which we will link their resources um, in the follow-up. It's a wonderful organization that provides resources 
around detection, um, diagnosis, and prevention. Um, and just recently, um, as Robert said, I've turned into an entrepreneur again, and I'm working for a company called Altoida to try to accelerate um, the detection of cognitive impairment through technology. And so it's it's exciting to continue to be in the field and to be on the innovation side uh, right now. So Sherry, let everybody know about you. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I just have to thank you, Brooks, for inviting me to join this conversation. This is more fun than work, I have to say. And thanks for, hey, Kensington <laughs> for, for sponsoring all of this today. Um, so as, as you said, I'm a gerontologist and I have my master's in gerontology. And, you know, a lot of people think that gerontology is a geriatrician, which is a medical doctor who treats people over the age of 60. But gerontologists are a little different. We look at the intersection of biology, psychology, and sociology. And how do we optimize um, all three of those areas in life to have optimal wellness and optimal health. So a lot of what I talk about is going to really focus on those three areas. And just in terms of my background, I've been in the, the aging and family caregiving space for the last 20 years. As Brooke said, that's when we met. Um, I was actually working with United Healthcare on family caregiver initiatives and programs that were actually um, delivered into employers, which I still do a lot of work with employers in terms of the work, workplace impact of employees who may be family caregivers. And I was the chairman of the National Alliance for Caregiving and did a lot of work with the Alzheimer's Association and, and group uh, Us Against Alzheimer's, the group that Brooks works with. I also have, am an author of um, two books. The first book, a, a Cast of Caregivers, which is really about family caregiving. And my second book comes out this summer and it's about wellness. And again, it's about that balance in life and how do we balance our body, our brain and our busy lives to achieve joy and happiness, which I think is what we're all looking for in life. So I'm just really thrilled to be here with you and talk a little bit about the brain health side of our conversation today. Awesome. You forgot to tell the listeners that I, I hosted your, your first book launch, but we can talk about she, that later. That's we, <laughs> Yes, we have pictures. <laughs> we do. We have pictures to prove it. So let's dive in here um, for our audience. I, and I, where I was hoping we could start and, and, I, and I'm happy to kick us off is let's just do a level set. You know, I think that um, you know, if I could see your faces right now and ask for a show of hands, everybody's hands would go up if I said, you know, um, have you heard of Alzheimer's disease? Awareness is really high. But what we're finding is that our knowledge is still pretty low in around the nuances of the disease. So let's start with the numbers. You know, sadly, there are about six and a half million people in our country with Alzheimer's disease. And th those are just the cases that we know about. Um, we know that two thirds of cases um, are among women. We know that women are two thirds the caregivers. And we know that African American and Latino populations are disproportionately impacted by the disease. Yet, despite the numbers, about 60% of cases of Alzheimer's disease go unrecognized in adults 65 plus. So just think about that for a minute. So we have a, po a huge population that we've identified of having Alzheimer's disease, but yet detection of it is not happening um, in a, in a uh, timely manner. And I'll get more into that in a moment. But let's even break it down further, because I know I hear people throwing around words like Alzheimer's and dementia um, and cognition. And I think it'd be helpful, Sherry, um, if we just did a level set. So think about an umbrella. Dementia is actually the umbrella term for the loss of memory, thinking, and reasoning. It's, it's to a point where it interferes with your daily life. So it's that is like the umbrella term. Like if you think about cancer as an umbrella term, Alzheimer's disease is a particular type of dementia and happens to be the most common form. And so that's why oftentimes people will use that phrase interchangeably. And it can get confusing because I know from my own experience, when my mother-in-law was diagnosed, um, the neurologist told us she has a little dementia. Well, no, in fact, she had moderate Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so we need to be careful across the board with the words that we use and, and how we describe it. So Alzheimer's disease, again, is the most common form of dementia. It's a brain disease that slowly impacts our memories, our thinking skills. Remember, our brains are our central organ. They control everything that we do. Um, and yet Alzheimer's disease um, you know, can start well before symptoms 
up here. It can start in our brain, which is why early detection is so critically important. So I'm not trying to alarm anybody with the numbers. You know, here we are, you know, six and a half million people. We think about um, women being impacted more than men. We think about, let's face it, it's the only disease in the top 10 for which there is no cure and there are very few treatments on the horizon. But that said, we are in a new day in Alzheimer's disease. And so what Sherry and I are hoping we can do today, now that we've level set the kind of the the uh, the facts and the figures, if you if you will, we want to talk about what it means for ourselves and, and what it means to be brain healthy, because there are things that we can do to improve our brain health. The only way that we can get there, though, is if we start talking about early detection sooner. And I gave you all that statistic. And Sherry, I don't know about you, but I continue to be kind of blown away by how challenging detection and diagnosis is of this disease. But if you unpack it, it kind of makes sense. You know, it is it is a disease with a lot of stigma, despite you know, our best efforts, and there are amazing advocacy groups out there and amazing innovators out there that are trying to break down the stigma. Nobody wants to talk about losing our memory. It's It feels shameful. It's hard to talk about. We don't always have the words to say what's going on. And we don't always have the words to identify when we see our loved one who might have be making changes. But it goes even further. It's even more complex than that. We know that providers don't always know what to do. You know, not everybody's trained, not all providers are trained, obviously, in neurology or gerontology, so they don't always know the signs and symptoms to look for. They don't always have access to the tools they need in order to um, have that faster uh, diagnosis. And so we think a pathway here to get to that earlier detection and diagnosis is to start what I like to say, Sherry's probably tired of my little sayings, but we need to flip Alzheimer's on its head and start talking about brain health. Our brains are our most vital organ, yet it is the least talked about topic in our healthcare conversations around the dining room table or you know, at the water cooler. It's just not something that we are talking about. And if we do, it's usually a joke, right? We say, oh my gosh, I forgot this. I hope I don't have dementia versus actually recognizing those subtle um, changes like we do so many other diseases. The last point I'll make, and then I know you're going to have a lot to say. Um, my father was diagnosed with colon cancer about two years ago, three years ago now. And he called me up and he said, Brooksy, I got some news. I have cancer in my colon. I said, oh, dad, are you okay? And let, tell me what's happening. He said, oh, it's fine. It's stage one, barely. And he intuitively knew that get, you know, getting that early diagnosis and getting that treatment was going to be so important to his health and well-being. And it proved to be. Conversely, we started noticing signs in my mother-in-law for years. We noticed things were changing. We noticed mistakes with the finances. We started to see that she wasn't comfortable talking on the phone because she couldn't discern our voices. And my husband's a twin. So you know where how that goes. The twin boys sound the same. She was diagnosed probably five years too late. And, and so even the treatments that were in clinic, you know, she was not a candidate for a lot of support. And I share that story with my family's permission because it's so important to realize that there are things that can be done if we get that earlier diagnosis. Um, and if we start to make brain health a regular part of our conversation, um, I don't know, Sherry, you, I know you've, you've been touched by so many people in the work that you do with this disease. And I know you join me on this soapbox that we have to start talking about it. Yeah, I think you touch upon something that's that is so critical, Brooks, and that is that we still don't know a lot about this disease just as a general population. And right. one of the things that I run into, and, and it has happened even in my own personal life, I have two very, very dear friends. One is an older gentleman who has been friends with uh, my parents, you know, for over 45 years, and we lost his wife to Alzheimer's. Um, the other story I have is I have a very dear best friend whose mother is now going through and progressing through the stages of Alzheimer's. And both of them still would say to me, 
you know, why does my mom keep asking me the same question over and over? Or, you know, we think that maybe this new drug is going to cure her. And they actually use that word. So I think there's still a lot that we don't really understand about the disease and we can help each other by talking more about it. But that's where it gets really tough for family caregivers because so often, sometimes a person who's diagnosed says, I don't want anybody to know about this. Right. And now you feel obligated to kind of keep those secrets, which means you're not reaching out as much. You're not maybe talking about it or sharing. And that's how we do tend to get some really great information and tips from other family caregivers or resources that you can be connected to. But to your point, you know, one of the great things that I think is happening is we are having this conversation now about brain health. You pointed to the yeah. fact Let's that your mother-in-law, it. yeah, <laughs> your mother-in-law was diagnosed, you said, you know, probably five years too late to even be able to be a candidate for some of the drugs out there that we know are only effective in the early stage Right. of the disease. And then they aren't effective forever. They have, you know, a, a shelf life, if you will, of about one and a half to maybe three years where the drugs actually work and then they don't really work as much anymore. But one of the things we do know is that right now people are being diagnosed too late. We are maybe seeing signs that we don't understand. And the diagnoses are coming 10 to 15 years when, you know, now we're in a certain stage of the disease. So we have a loved one who may have been living with this disease for 10 or 15 years. Um, So when we talk about brain health, I want to just kind of flip it because you said it's the most vital organ in our body. And boy, is that the truth? You know, we know a lot about our hearts and heart health and everything, but I want to give you just some interesting factoids, if you will, about our brains. So first of all, we have over 100 billion neurons that are connecting and and carrying messages, what we call neurotransmitters, they're doing over a hundred trillion messages in our brains. Think about that for a minute. That's amazing. The machinery that it takes to do that. The other thing I'm gonna talk about in a minute with prevention is, you know, we talk about heart health and we talk about things like high blood pressure. Well, one of the things that we know is hypertension is really vital when it also comes to Alzheimer's disease and keeping that systolic number, which is, you know, the 120 over 80 that we all get told is the perfect number. The 120 is the top number. We want to keep that definitely below 130, closer to 120 if we can. And the reason why is because when we have that pressure in the blood vessels in our brains, it can cause little potholes, if you will, to occur in those blood vessels where they um, become leaky. And this is then where we see some of the toxins who are, they're coming into the brain, they're creating those tau tangles or, you know, that beta amyloid plaque, which are the two classic signs that we see that really tell you, you do have Alzheimer's and, um, and hypertension is really causing that. Now think about this. Here's another little factoid. We have over 400 miles of blood vessels in our brains. 400 miles, a super, super highway up there that's working. So you can understand where if you've got hypertension, you've got high blood pressure, and it's putting all the pressure on those blood vessels, you can get those little potholes that are happening. And these are the things that we want to try to prevent. And then just as another little factoid that I think is interesting is that our brains are processing so much information. And people have said to me, what's the difference between just normal, I'm getting a little bit older, I forgot my grandkids name the other day, or, you know, I I kind of forgot where I put my keys or, or something like that. That is just normal cognitive aging. And it's very different. The signs of Alzheimer's or, you know, dementia, as you were talking, are different. So in our, in other words, you don't just misplace your keys, you put your keys in the sugar bowl or the fridge, or you don't just forget the name of your grandchild who might be five years old, you forget the name of your son, you forget the name of your spouse or a dear friend that you've known forever. These are just little signs telling us that there's something different going on. And I want to just give us a little bit of grace because I've talked about how our brains are like computers. And if you think about it, you know, when we have a computer, we're saving files all the time, right? And then our our brains are, you know, our computers can sift through those files fairly quickly. Well, when you have not a lot of files, you're a younger person, it's easy to go through just a few files. Think about how many files we're saving up by the time we get to be 50 or 60. Okay, it takes a little bit more time to get through the file to find that factoid or, you know, that name or whatever it is. With Alzheimer's, the file isn't there. It's deleted. 
So right. the minute that somebody says, oh, hi, you know, uh, hi, Barbara, or, you know, my name's Barbara, the file doesn't stay with the person with Alzheimer's, it's gone. And this is something I think that helps people understand what the disease is really all about. I love that, Cherry, and and I just want to um, I want to focus there for another minute before we flip and do the all the hope, yes. all the empowerment. <laughs> we got good stuff to share. I we do, we promise. But I think it's so important because you know, again, I'm talking about my dad. I know he's not tuning in, although I did tell him about it. Um, you know, he'll tell me things, and and I'll say, Dad, that's that's just normal aging, you know, our bodies change as we age. I ha- I need to use that computer file example that, that you just gave, but it's also, it's pretty real. It's pretty realistic to understand like our bodies change as we age, our hair changes as we age. Well, so do our brains. Yes. And it's just, and so not to assume it's a normal part of aging, of course, and then, and really understanding the difference between um, forgetting our keys and putting our keys in the sugar bowl. And Lisa Genova is an author. She often will say, you know, we live in such a busy light world right now too, that if you're distracted, I mean, I've had friends my age call me and say, oh my gosh, I I keep forgetting this. And I said, well, were you distracted when you got home? Were you on the phone talking to your, you know, your kid in the kitchen, talking you know, figuring out dinner, if you're distracted and you do something, it also impacts our memory. So um, it's more complex than just, I have Alzheimer's yeah. or I don't. Well, to, to that point, and, and Lisa Genova, we we love her. Her, her books are wonderful. And she was the author of Still Alice, which is still a, a really great movie if you're wondering what this disease is about, particularly early onset, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about. But, you know, I want to tell people that our brains, again, are are these magnificent machines. And every single day we are taking in this data and visual stimulation and little bits of information. It's the equivalent of reading a 350 word or I'm sorry, 350 page book every single day. That's the data that our brains are processing. So let's get, let's get down to, there's this recent Lancet commission uh, report that came out. Let's just break down maybe boom, boom, boom. Let's give folks yeah. some things. I want to give you the top today. line. Yeah. So the Lancet yeah. commission report was great. Came out a couple of years ago. It identified 12 different lifestyle factors that we should be following that literally could reduce the incidences in cases of Alzheimer's by 40%. And so it's things like, you Say know, that one more time. I think people so, need to hear that one more time and get out their pens. <laughs> so we could actually reduce 40% of all of the Alzheimer's cases that are out there right now, if we just simply modify our lifestyles in these 12 different areas that the commission identified, we don't have time to go through all 12, but it's things like don't smoke. It's things like address hearing loss. Don't allow your hearing loss to go unmanaged. It's things like air pollution. And there's a lot of other factors, but I want to focus on kind of the, the easy ones, if you will, the top ones. And I mentioned the hypertension, it's, it's heart health months. Anything that's good for your heart is actually really good for your brain. And so we talked about keeping that hypertension down, how important that is. That also plays into things though, like also um, moving more. And, you know, we always think that exercise and diet are kind of the keys. Well, they are very important. So for instance, um, with diet, you know, one of the things I was um, so excited yesterday because uh, Susan with Kensington invited me to come listen to a speaker they had um, who was Annie Fenn, and she has a new book out called The Brain Health Kitchen. Wonderful, wonderful cookbook, and it was a really delightful event. But whether it's Annie's book or there's another great book that I love, which is by Bonnie Kaplan, and it's called The Better Brain. Um, I have the word down here, here, but it's how to overcome anxiety, combat depression, and reduce ADHD, stress, and Alzheimer's with nutrition. You know, one of the things we have to think about is um, what are the types of foods that are going to help us be brain healthy? And we know things like what we call eating the rainbow, getting all those colorful foods into your diet are going to be really helpful, but also getting the right amount of minerals and nutrients. You know, we're a fast food nation. It's just easier, you know, when you shop the grocery store, if you can shop the perimeter where all the fresh fruit food is, that's best. If you go inside to the packaged food, one of the things that we know is 57% of adults and 67% of children are eating ultra processed chemicals on a daily basis instead of the fresh 
clean food that we really need in our diets. Now, the other thing we mentioned is moving. And the good news about moving, we always think, well, I don't have any time to go to the gym. That's going to take me at least 45 minutes or 60 minutes. 10 minutes a day is really kind of the baseline for just maybe getting your heart rate up or, you know, getting outside in nature. One of the things I love, I love the whole nature neuroscience because the brain gets fed off of being in nature. So if you can take a walk outside, I know in some places right now, it's super, super cold. It's maybe a little tough to get out and do those walks, but Anytime you can get outside or just be in nature for a few minutes, it actually is reducing what we call oxidative stress, which is another um, kind of risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And it, it, it definitely decreases our brain health. So just little things that we can do and then sleep. Okay. We all know about sleep science, but maybe what you don't know about sleep is that when your body goes to sleep, your brain goes to work. Your brain is doing all the work at night to flush all the toxins out of the brain and also to regulate the emotions that you felt during the day, which is really, really important. You know, when our mom said, oh, honey, don't worry about it. Just sleep on it. It'll be better in the morning. Who knew that mom were neuroscientists? Because that's exactly <laughs> what we need to do. Because when we wake up the next day, the emotions have been modulated a little bit. And so getting the ability to get that good seven to eight hours of sleep becomes really vital for brain health. The other thing is think of your body and your brain as a smartphone. We have to recharge at night. If you didn't recharge your phone, it wouldn't work and all of us would be destroyed. Our lives would be over if we didn't have our phones that we had to connect to, right? <laughs> So think about the same kind of situation with your body and your brain. You've got to recharge it at night. And then blue light emission, which comes from all the technology, whether it's the television, scrolling through social media late at night, even the artificial light that we have, that's all um, really uh, challenging to our circadian rhythms, which are our light dark cycles. And it's telling the body, because the blue light is coming off of our technology, it's telling the body, stay awake, stay awake. So what we really yeah. need to do is we need to power down all that stuff at least a couple hours before we go to sleep and change any night lights you have from a traditional blue light to an amber orangey light. Um, when I change the lights in, in our home, I know my boyfriend said, it, I feel like I, I live in the red light district now because all the red <laughs> lights come on at night. But the bottom line is, is that when you need to get up and as we get older, we do need to get up in the middle of the night and do our, our, do our business or whatever it doesn't wake your body up because you still feel like it's dusk. Your body is still in that kind of more restful state. So it's amazing what you can do to just kind of be brain healthy in those ways. And you gave me that tip and, and we've used it too. And it's made a huge, huge difference. And I think, you know, I think it's really important for people to, um, hear the sleep piece, because I, I know when I've done my talks around the country and asked people to raise their hand, if they got a good night's sleep and said, do you know, that was good for your brain? Most of the hands go down. And I think we have a real opportunity, you know, from a generation perspective. I mean, I have two teenagers now and I tell you, and you know, this, cause you've been in my kitchen, you know, I've said to them when I give them salmon and I give them, um, you know, healthy food, I'll say, this is good for your brain. And they're, they look at me like what now they could recite the statistics themselves, but trying to normalize the conversation is so important. And, and I think we have a real opportunity with this new, um, hope around brain yeah. health. And I just want to say one more thing about sleep, because I do a lot of talks around the country and I've had people come up after I talk about this and say, you know, I've been getting four, six hours of sleep a night and I, I do fine. Well, here's the thing. One of the things we know in gerontology, it's called epigenetic effects. And it's where you have downstream impact of things that you're doing right now, just like how we eat, how we exercise, how our lifestyles are, are going to have effect later in life. So again, if you're not getting enough good sleep, you're not clearing those toxins out of your brain, that's going to unfortunately hurt you later in life. So Absolutely. it's important. Well, ladies, I'm sorry I'm late. I was napping. Um, I am, I am <laughs> those running work out. Too. <laughs> I am running out after this and getting an amber light. Um, anyway, thank you all for joining us. My name is Susan Evans and my relationship with Alzheimer's is my father was diagnosed 10 years ago. And our, our family made a very difficult decision to, um, to place him in a community, to move him into a community. And we chose Kensington Senior Living because of their exceptional 
care and expertise in, um, in memory care. So thank you, Kensington, for producing these educational events. It's so great. And the information we're getting today, I love factoid. I'm taking that for sure. <laughs> and all the way you broke it down to make it really understanding and all the analogies you use. I'm, I'm picturing potholes in my head and, and 400 <laughs> miles of, of circuits and trillions of, you know, it's hope, hopefully they're all hitting on the same time, but um, Brooks and Sherry, we're so lucky to have you here. Um, so we're going to get right to some questions. And I just want to remind the audience that everyone that registered will receive links to contact Sherry, to contact Brooks for additional information. And you'll also receive a copy of the webinar to share with friends and family. So Brooks, I'm going to start with you about innovation. Sure. We are seeing so much innovation in the field. What are you most excited about? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I would say three things, you know, first and foremost, I would say there are more treatments today and more on the horizon than ever before. And what does that mean? Well, there are two drugs that have been approved for the earlier stage of disease um, that prolong progression and really aim to impact the underlying causes of Alzheimer's disease, um, the amyloid. Uh, so I think that is really promising. And in addition to that, there are treatments for the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease in the later stages for things like agitation and irritability. So there is a lot of innovation. There are companies coming and, and working tirelessly um, in research to, to bring um, more therapy to market. I also think there's a lot of excitement around detection and diagnosis, which that might not be like a woohoo exciting thing. But again, if the science is telling us that the earlier we can detect and diagnose this disease and diseases of the brain, that opens the door for treatment. It opens the door for families to plan. It opens the door for conversations to think about what are my next steps. I'm tired of the stories where families get a diagnosis out of a chaotic event or an emergency. And so it does give me hope that more and more companies and more and more organizations like the like Gates Ventures and um, the Gates Foundation focusing on Alzheimer's disease, you know, there's just a lot more investment and excitement around detection and diagnosis. And I would say the third thing is really this shift in trying to be brave and talk about our brains, trying to be empowered to learn what we can do, not being afraid to actually ask the hard questions as opposed to making a joke when we're not able to remember where we put our keys, but to really start to be aware and to start noticing and to start talking. And I, I think the science in, in brain health and prevention is catching up and giving us those tools that Sherry did such a beautiful job talking about. So. I would say along the continuum, I'm excited about prevention. I'm, I'm thrilled to see more and more detection and diagnosis um, in terms of technology. And then, and then ultimately for those that do have the disease that there are more treatments available and we need to make those accessible to as many people um, as we can who need them. Yeah, I agree. And Sherry touched on this too, is I do believe we've come a long way with the stigma with yeah. brain disease and the education of Alzheimer's. And there's so many different types of brain disease and it's, it's, it's all up here. And I loved what you shared about your father, um, Brooks, early detection. So it's my understanding, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist at all, but it's my understanding that the plaque and, and the amyloid start developing as young as your 30s. So the more information we can get as a community on early detection, the better off we're going to be in um, some type of a, I don't know if it'll be a cure or a cocktail similar to AIDS that because everybody's brain is so different, but the sooner the better, in, in my opinion. Uh, I, Sherry, same question to you. Yeah, well, uh, you know, um, so along those lines, uh, one of the things I'm excited about is uh, more of a focus on brain exercise. And, you know, we've, we've talked about brain games, right? And a lot of people think, well, if I play a crossword puzzle or I do Sudoku or whatever, is that going to help? Well, it might help you remember how to play that game, but it's actually not really working out your brain. And I love this suite of exercises from a company called Brain HQ. They worked with Tom Brady, by the way. 
on his um, cognitive performance when he was still wanting to play into his 40s. But one of the things that we know is that we've got different regions of the brain and we have to work out all of those regions. Think about your physical workout. You're not just going to work out one arm. You know, you're not just going to do the triceps and that's it. You've got to work out really the whole body. And that's what we're thinking about with the brain. And one of the things that's really great is making music. Now, whether you're a musician who plays or whether you just sing along, but actually being actively rather than passively involved, which is listening, you want to sing along with that song in the car. It is a full brain workout. It's working out all the different regions of your brain. So we love that. Um, the other thing that's happening that I'm excited about is I just interviewed what he is a gastrophysicist from the University of Oxford in London. And I do a podcast, by the way, if you're interested, I do a lot of really wonderful interviews with people like Brooks. Um, it's called Caregiving Club on Air, but I just interviewed him and he, he uses music to actually um, fit with the nutritional needs that we have. So let me give you, for instance, if you play higher pitched tones, you can actually reduce the sugar in your diet and you, your brain will still think that that food is sweet because of the music that you're playing. If you play lower pitch tones like jazz or blues, you know, uh, you know uh, Johnny Cash or Frank Sinatra, you'll actually enhance the, the taste of saltiness or savoriness. So you can reduce the sodium, which again goes back to hypertension and high blood pressure. You can reduce that salt in your diet and you play that music while you're eating. You're still going to think it's salty. I love this stuff. I'm, I'm a nerd for all of this neuroscience and how we can bring these things, but it's all about our five senses. You know, it's about the sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. We have to work those things out. I've got a little brain hack I do where I tell you, take one minute and look at five things around you and really look at them. You know, take another minute and touch four things on your desk or your area. Take another minute and listen to three sounds. Take one more minute, try to smell two different smells. And the last minute is taste something. That is a five minute brain workout that you can do every single day. So Brooks, you can start playing music when you serve your salmon. <laughs> And what about dance? I've, I've always heard that dance is really good for our brains because it, I mean, it makes any sense. Any kind of movement, any, any kind of moving. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. It's music, dance. If we could bring all of those things together, that's, that's even more perfect. And getting out in nature, you know, I'm a huge, big, what they call biophilia, which is love of nature, love of life. That is my new well home design. I'm doing a lot of work in that area, but being out in nature and bringing nature inside, having a beautiful view that we can look out on greenery or trees or shrubs or flowers, having wood elements in the home or fire elements, um, you know, just having open spaces. It goes back to our ancient brains. When we were out living on that African savanna, it actually comforts us. It soothes us from the stresses of the day when we can bring some of those nature elements into our environment. So I'm, I'm all for that. So I have a challenge for the audience and that's car karaoke. We're going to start singing. I, I think all those things, all those things, I'm so glad that we're taping this and sending it out to everybody because you don't have to take notes. You can listen to it all over again. So many tips, so many and great you know analogies for understanding and educating. Thank you. And, you know, Susan, I just add, cause I, I, I've been where the audience is in terms of you know, listening to ideas on being healthy and, and it can be overwhelming. There's a lot here. So I would just offer to, to anybody that's listening that feels overwhelmed, pick one thing, you know, I mean, you don't have to start eating a Mediterranean diet and getting eight hours of sleep and walking for 30 minutes. Like maybe you pick one thing, maybe it's for the next week, you're going to try to go to bed 10 or 15 minutes earlier without your phone or, you know, whatever the the tip is for you, or one week you're going to focus on your food and then you're going to add exercise. So I do, you know, my public health person in me just wants to remind people that you're not failing if you're not doing all of it every day. Um, but if, but a little bit does go a long way. Yeah. I feel I like Brooks is my more. publicist because that's, that's the whole theme of my new book is <laughs> baby, baby steps. Yeah. Just little tiny things that don't take much time. You know, I'm, I'm saying seven minutes or less to do one thing that it's going to make you feel better is, is great. So you're absolutely right But the baby right steps on. really add up. They I do. think they're really impactful. Yep. Um, Sherry, know the difference between normal and I, I was just wanting to, because we have about uh, 10 minutes left here, but sure. really what would you want is a one takeaway from our listeners tonight, Sherry? 
Well, I, th I think certainly um, we want to educate ourselves more about our brains, both for prevention, brain health, but also if we are impacted by this disease, we want to have those conversations with families earlier rather than later so we can plan ahead. This can be a very expensive disease for families. And that's, you know, something that breaks my heart. And then I do a lot of work in the workplace and with employers. And I think if, if you're working, be an advocate for this disease. So many people, again, there's stigma around it. Help educate others about what either what you're going through or what you see or what you know, because it's going to help other people start to really talk to each other and help each other more. I'll tell you, I've sat in so many support groups and the best tips and resources you get are from other family caregivers. So the more talking we can do about this, I think the better. And, and share resources. There really are resources out there. Um, and don't be afraid. I, I couldn't agree more. I felt so isolated trying to navigate this disease. I knew nothing about it. I felt so incredibly lonely and um, like my hands were tied behind my back. But look at these resources. I mean, you guys are both incredible resources. Brooks, what would you share as a takeaway? Well, I mean, there's so much I could choose from. I would say, number one, you know, um, Alzheimer's disease is not a normal part of aging. Um, I encourage people to remember to get to know their brain, start noticing, uh, noticing changes, um, you know, being aware and, and being, uh, you know, inclined to, to be thinking about it more often and being intentional is really important. I really think there is a lot of hope. I mean, I know we spent a bit of time at the beginning talking about the disease and the statistics, really just to give folks a level set. But I hope people leave this conversation, Susan and Sherry, with hope because there are things we can do. You know, we know heart disease exists. We know cancer exists. We know their risk factors, but we aren't, um, you know, it's not a, a dire situation. And this doesn't have to be either. There are things we can do every day to improve our brain health that are fun that we can be doing together in community. So I would just encourage people to be hopeful, to be aware, and, and to really um, be intentional about your brain because it's your most important organ. And speaking of which, we just had a question come in about um, a woman whose mother was diagnosed and uh, she's 58 and she's wondering, are there tests for early detection or is it solely based on like a brain MRI or neuropsych eval? Uh, is there anything that she can do if she's concerned? Maybe you guys could touch on genetics or when to be concerned, but is there anything else she can do besides just uh, the 12 healthy habits we talked about today? Yeah, I, I'll take that first, Brooks, and I know you'll have something to add, but I, you know, we do know that about 5% of Alzheimer's is genetically connected. And it usually does happen within this subset of early onset, which means you're diagnosed before the age of 65. So I would say if you're a family member, again, it's, you know, we don't have cures. And so people say to me, well, what if I, I know I do have a risk or I may definitely get it? What am I going to do? We've talked about those prevention and healthy lifestyle factors. And every single day, the researchers are coming up with the most amazing breakthroughs. You don't know that tomorrow there may be an announcement that just really blows everything, you know, wide open on this. But um, I would say there is genetic testing. You can talk to your neurologist that you're loved one is working with and ask them about that genetic testing if you're if you want to do that as a family member who has somebody again with early onset now if your loved one gets diagnosed at 75 or 80 there is no uh real genetic connection that we see in older onset alzheimer's it's very random and it doesn't mean that you're going to get it if your grandmother had it yeah, and just in terms of the tests themselves, um, there are a lot of resources. We'll put them in the follow-up email, uh, links to websites, but just for everyone. So there are cognitive assessments, which are more like a screening tool, and there, there are hundreds of them that have been um, uh, documented by the National Institutes on Aging. That uh, um, It's not often that a primary care provider will do that, but you can certainly ask and try. Um, and, and obviously I talked, I would, for this person, I would talk to your loved one's, um, neurologist, but for those of you wondering, you know, there are some more and more, um, primary care, um, 
providers, I mean, it's part of the Medicare wellness visit, um, although they can use observation, meaning they can just use basic conversation to do that screen and that counts. But oftentimes they will do a simple um, cognitive test. They would more likely do that first before they would do any type of neurological workup, which often does include a pretty thorough um, uh, uh meeting with a neuropsych uh, doctor to go through a number of scenarios and questions. And then, you know, they build from there. So it isn't a short process, but oftentimes the screening uh, using a cognitive assessment is the first step. I couldn't agree more to have a baseline to see where you're going. You have to have something yeah. to compare it to see where you're going. So I'm can I just say one quote, sorry, yes. Susan, I, I was on a panel with a neurologist um, a while back and someone asked the question, you know, I've gone to my doctor and asked for a cognitive assessment to get a baseline. And they said, no, you're, you know, no, no reason to do it or something like that. What should I do? And the neurologist said, find another doctor. Oh. <gasps> So that's not always possible. I want to be mindful. Not everybody can just go to any doctor they want and people have different um, insurance and, and whatnot. But I think it's a really important point to those of you listening. If you are noticing changes or if you have worries about your memory and thinking, you know, we want you to feel empowered to speak up um, yeah. because you have a right to demand, you know, your health care. <laughs> yeah, I would also say just as an adjunct to that, um, certainly definitely find another doctor. If you if you don't feel comfortable with what your doctor is telling you about anything, find yeah. a different doctor. But also there's also some clinical trials. And, and a lot yeah. of the studies that are being done are asking for people who either might have this genetic connection or who are perfectly healthy. And they're taking brain scans and doing other things that can kind of help determine biomarkers and other things that'll help determine you know, where you're at, but you can get involved in some of those clinical trials as well. And we can put the link. It's a great point, Sherry. And let's put the link. We can put that link, Susan, to you so we can share that with folks. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I can't wait to hear your response on this question, but Anne asked, what about Prevagen and some of those other supplements from jellyfish? Who wants to start? I'm not a doctor, so I'm not. You want me to start? No, no, I'm just I am not going to speak to. Um, I'm not going to speak to specific supplements, but yeah, I'll just make this comment. And I'm not a medical doctor either, so that's the caveat there. But you know, um, anything that doesn't have a lot of good evidence-based science and what we call replication, where there's numerous studies now that show the same outcome, uh, we see the same thing in brain games. I mentioned Brain HQ because they've got over 200 peer reviewed studies that show that they can change your, your brain performance. A lot of the brain game stuff doesn't do it. Prevagen and some of these other supplements are kind of in that similar, there's just not enough science there. And you should really look to things like nutrients and, and other vitamins to get it, not, not some of these supplements. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And they, the other thing is none of us are doctors. So you should probably talk to your doctor. For sure. Yeah. And there is a really interesting resource from the um, Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. They have a, a website called Cognitive Vitality. And within it, they actually do a, a comparison of supplements and different minerals and nutrients that's really interesting based on their research and research of others. So we're happy to pop that in the resource link too. Um, and another question about hormone replacement, timing of it, thoughts on it, uh, perimenopausal, postmenopausal, any thoughts on hormonal replacement therapy? You know, again, I'm not a doctor, so it's hard to talk to some of these more specific things. Um, so I would definitely have that discussion because we do know that there is impact to uh, brain performance because of hormonal changes mm -hmm. that are going on. So it's really important to have that discussion with your doctor. And I've also heard about two thirds of everyone diagnosed is a woman. So one yeah. would suspect right. it could be hormonally related. And there's a there's a growing number of research that's happening with hormone replacement therapy. So um, they there was just an article published about it. So it'd be um, we can probably find that too and and share it. But I agree. And and I think the whole HRT it's just such a, it's so personalized and individual because that that individual might have other things going on or a family history of of different diseases. So it's not a one size fits all answer, unfortunately. Yeah. It's complicated, just like the brain is so complicated. Yeah. I would agree. But ladies, I can't thank you enough. 
Um, and I'm sure I'll speak for our audience. Uh, we all can't thank you enough. And Kensington Senior Living thanks you for generously giving your time to help educate our nation today. Um, it's been a wonderful webinar. So thank you so much. And everybody should look in their inbox for a copy of the webinar and links to these wonderful ladies' resources that they shared today. Have a nice thank evening you. or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Thank, thank you. you, Susan and Kensington. And thank you, Brooks, for inviting me. Thank you all so much. Take care.